In this episode of Travelogue, we're in the stimulating southern Chinese city, Shenzhen, famous as a design, tech and economic hub. But in this first of a two-part series, we dive beneath the surface, step back centuries and discover there's much more to Shenzhen than its soaring silver skyline. Welcome to Travelogue, where you get to traipse around China with me. My name is Min Zui Li, you can call me Zui, and in this episode and the next, I'm going to be coming to you from a bold and bustling city called Shenzhen, right next to Hong Kong. Now, Shenzhen is one of China's most powerful financial hubs, and yet just 40 years ago, it was a cluster of fishing and farming villages. But look at it now. A sleek urban colossus, an incubator for tech trailblazers and next-gen design, contrasted with lush green spaces of sheer serenity. It's a massive metropolis, and even in the two-part series, it'll be a tight squeeze fitting everything in. So, we've picked Shenzhen's best bits for you, the most photogenic ones. Shenzhen, in Guangdong province, is often dubbed the Silicon Valley of China, a city with total economic output higher than entire countries such as Chile, Finland, Egypt and Vietnam. But when and how did this all begin? Well, in December 1978, China launched economic reforms and opened up to foreign investment. The following year, Shenzhen was upgraded to city status and in 1980, it was designated as China's first special economic zone. In these zones, business and trade laws are different from the rest of the country, more free market oriented, with incentives for attracting international capital. Today, Shenzhen continues to flourish. Shenzhen may indeed seem like a very useful city, but that's because it is, well, at least on the surface. The reality is Shenzhen has a very deep and long history. So this is a very good example. I'm at Dapeng Fortress, which was built more than 620 years ago as a defense against pirates. I guess Shenzhen has the best of both worlds, both old and new. Located 55 kilometers east of the ultra-modern city center, Dapeng Fortress is a living, breathing fossil of old China. Enclosed within imposing walls and accessed by three grand gates, Dapeng's web of stone alleyways, lined with old residences, is perfect for a leisurely stroll. For half a millennium, Dapeng successfully stood up to external aggression. In its glory days, heroes emerged from the battalions garrisoned here. But no soldiers have been stationed here for a century now, and gradually, civilians have taken over. For a while, Dapeng succumbed slowly to weathering and neglect, but fortunately, steps were taken to safeguard it, and in 2001, it was placed under state protection. The fortress covers little more than a tenth of a square kilometre. Don't let its size fool you though. It may be small, but its role in naval history has been huge. And now, it stands just as firmly as it did back in 1571, when it refused to yield during a 40-day siege by Japanese pirates. Peppered around the place are vestiges of its military might, this is the mansion belonging to General Lai Enjue. On September 4, 1839, four British gunships opened fire on a flotilla of Chinese war junks that were enforcing an embargo on the British community in Kowloon. Led by General Lai of Dapeng Fortress, the Chinese Maritime Force 
succeeded in resisting the attack. The skirmish was the first armed conflict of the First Opium War. General Lai went on to become Admiral of the Guangdong Navy, and his legend lives on. It turns out that traces of Darpeng's military past don't just exist in tales of combat and generals' courtyard homes. You can literally sink your teeth into them. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Local mi gao, or rice biscuits, are nutritious and have a long shelf life, so are traditionally part of soldiers' rations. <laughs> They're not too difficult to make, so it could be mass produced. There's something strangely soothing about hammering away at these biscuits. I like it because it doesn't require any mental effort, aside from restraining myself from eating them straight from the mold. Okay. <laughs> Almost broke a tooth there. That was much crunchier than I expected. Well, I can't believe that these used to be soldiers' rations, but these days it's a local snack that every traveller here should try. I mean, the best uh, souvenirs are always the edible ones, right? <laughs> You may hear long-term Shenzhenites call their city by its nickname, Pengcheng or Peng City, which you now know is derived from the name Da Peng. And just FYI, a Peng is a gigantic mythical bird. Da Peng Fortress was built during the Ming Dynasty in 1394 to offer protection from the Japanese pirates operating in the southern coastal areas of Guangdong Province. The base defended an area covering present-day Hong Kong and eastern Shenzhen. From then on, and all the way through the following Qing Dynasty until 1899, Darpeng would be garrisoned by a force hundreds strong. They were constantly under threat of attack. I can't imagine how different this place must have been back then. I spent my last bit of time at Darpeng Fortress in a tiny museum fascinated by antiques salvaged from its glorious naval past. Unexpectedly, finding such a historical gem in futuristic Shenzhen has made this visit so much better. Coming up next, one street, two systems, where Shenzhen meets Hong Kong. A Hakka-style banquet and a rural village, now a painter's paradise, and an art lover's happy hunting ground. Shenzhen is located in the very south of China, within the Pearl River Delta megalopolis. The Pearl River Delta is one of the most densely urbanized and rapidly developing regions in the world. 
One of the other sites on the Pearl River Delta is the neighbouring Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of China. Well, in Shenzhen, there are many border crossings between the Chinese mainland and Hong Kong, and this behind me is one of them. If you manage to pass through this gate, you'll find yourself on a street called Chongying Street, and it's really special because on one side, it belongs to the Chinese mainland, and of course, the other side belongs to Hong Kong. The only thing is that, as a foreigner, I'm not allowed in there, even if I look really local, but my cameramen have local Chinese ID, so they'll be my eyes. Song Ying Gai in Cantonese literally translates as China England Street. It's a reminder that Hong Kong was a British colony from the end of the First Opium War in 1842 until its return to China in 1997. Previously, the street was the only area in Hong Kong accessible to people from the Chinese mainland and it did a roaring trade in foreign goods. It was also the site of Shenzhen's first stock exchange which, by the way, is today the world's eighth largest. This tree, with its trunk in the Chinese mainland and its branches in the Hong Kong SAR, has witnessed immense change. Much as the owner of this restaurant has. Before the 1997 handover, Ms. Liu hawked porridge and noodles from a trolley on the 250 metre long Chongying Gai. In 2011, she achieved her dream of opening a restaurant, and today, for a special occasion, she's making one of her most popular specialities, Hakka Pen Cai. Oh, <laughs> 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 I say we because the camera crew and I have all been invited to an exclusive party. The Hakka are Han Chinese people whose history of migration has given them a unique language and ancestry. The Pen Cai originated long ago when Hakka families would bring a plate to Chinese New Year gatherings. But due to the difficult transport conditions, the food would arrive cold. So everyone's contribution was poured into a single pot and heated up. Thus, Pen Cai was born. <laughs> this is my favorite type of meal, you know. You have to really dig your chopsticks in and everyone has to share. It forces you to really celebrate, I guess, uh, your friends, your family, your community. And this uh, Pen Cai is actually usually eaten uh, only during times of festivities or celebrations. And um, I think today is actually a very good time for celebration because this is the last day that this old store is open and Lao Ban over here, the boss, is opening a new store elsewhere. Um, and she's brought in all her, you know, her favorite customers and her most loyal customers uh, to really get in on the action. So, excellent. <laughs> Successful in all aspects of her life. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Liu stresses that she pays special attention to presentation because typically Hakka cuisine is appetizing but not eye catching. Here, at another restaurant, presentation is key for the signature dish. And by dish, I mean one that's satellite dish size. And as part of the presentation, a rather raucous ritual. This is Da Pen Yu, 
a colossal ready-to-eat plate of scrumptiousness. It hails from Shunda, another city in Guangdong, and it's a seafood showcase tailored to the taste buds of the southern Chinese. While Pen Cai is a Hakka meal, Da Pen Yu is Teochu. Like the Hakka, the Teochu are Han people, united by a unique language and ancestry. Teochu cuisine is well known for its seafood and vegetarian offerings. Delicious! Next, we're filling up on art in a place called Dafen Oil Painting Village. In the northeast of Shenzhen, Dafen is known as the world's oil painting factory. In its heyday, before the 2008 global financial crisis, it apparently accounted for almost 60% of all new commercial oil paintings worldwide. Dafen was once a rice farming community of just 300 or so inhabitants. In the late 1980s, Hong Kong painter and businessman Huang Jiang took up residence here and took on apprentices and orders. And so began the Dafen oil painting industry. Interestingly, Dafen artists are not all professionals. There are many amateurs, namely local self-taught farmers. The village now boasts more than 1,200 galleries and an oil painting workforce of 8,000 all centred on a core area of less than half a square kilometre. While most engage in the reproduction and trading of oil paintings, replicas of the works of artists like Van Gogh, Picasso, Warhol and Dali, there's a growing demand for pieces that reflect Chinese culture. Among the sea of art, a studio has caught my eye, and best of all, the artist is on set, busy creating a masterpiece. His expertise is in cloisonné, traditional enamelware. I could spend hours upon hours here, wandering through the narrow lanes where every tiny space is utilised for art. But there's one place I don't want to miss, the Dauphin Art Museum. Dauphin is a magnet for artists from all over the country, whether they're escaping poverty or pursuing a passion. Whatever the motivation, these talented people have found a sanctuary for creative expression in Shenzhen, and I am wowed. I've always been a huge fan of art, especially the abstract stuff, so this exhibition is just my cup of tea. In Dafen village, it's no longer mostly about reproducing famous works. The main focus now is on conceiving individual ideas and bringing them to life. You know, Shenzhen may be known as just a city full of money-making opportunities and also it has a rather unfortunate reputation as being a wenhua shamo or cultural desert. But after coming to this village, I just have to disagree. You know, this place in particular, I think, has a very distinct culture and that's made possible by all the migrants coming from all across China with very artistic souls. I think it's very eclectic and very fresh and that's the beauty of it. Coming up next, it's slip, slop, slap with a sunscreen because we go beachside where I get to know more of Shenzhen from both beneath the surface and way up high. Xiaomei Sha Seaside Tourist Scenic Area, 
30 kilometers east of downtown Shenzhen. It's being promoted as the Oriental Hawaii, so I'm getting all geared up to spend a very active afternoon. So we're out here on the water. I've got my sweaty, shiny, sunscreen face on and uh, also a very tight-fitting wetsuit. So you might be able to guess what exciting thing I'm going to be doing next. Woo! Okay, for those of you who followed my travelogue adventures, you may know of my bird phobia. But I'm also not terribly keen on fish either. So, to be honest, entering fishy territory isn't my favourite leisure pursuit. I mean, I love swimming at the beaches back in Sydney with the cold crashing waves and I've snorkelled with stingrays and turtles, but I prefer not to go too far beneath the surface. You can sympathise, right? And, you know, all this equipment, having to breathe through just my mouth. Plus, it's been raining here these past few days, making the water murkier than usual. What if there's a giant groper waiting for me? That's more than enough whining for me. Let's do this. After all, this is Xiaomeisha, and it's known for its range of recreational activities. So, I've got to give this a go. I'm very relieved the instructor is not letting go of me as we head deeper and deeper. And after about 15 minutes, I'm very relieved too when I see the scuba diving hand gesture for resurface, often confused with thumbs up. I need to get these signals straight. Fortunately, waving at you doesn't mean, stop, I want to stay down here until my oxygen runs out. It transpires that the hardest part is trying to get out of the water and back onto the boat, even after offloading all the breathing apparatus. Xiaomeisha is just across the sea from Hong Kong SAR and is surrounded by hills on three sides. It's a crescent-shaped beach with adequate amenities and a great selection of aqua entertainment activities. It seems like I've picked the two on the list that require the most equipment because I clearly like to make my life difficult. <laughs> Like wearing a big nappy. I'm all set. Well, now that we saw Shenzhen from underwater, it's time that we see Shenzhen from a different perspective. The sky. Okay. Okay. Oh man, it's pretty windy, so uh, let's hope 
with this guy as well. with me. <laughs> so he does all the work and I just sit back and chill, huh? Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And we're off. I did not expect to be parasailing in Shenzhen, that's for sure. he says, and it'd be too risky being up here. That makes me feel 100% at ease. Hello, Shenzhen! <laughs> and it proves a tad challenging for him and the guy in the boat to coordinate a touchdown. Hello, cameraman! <laughs> that you came along to, discovering a softer side to Shenzhen that's not all about tech and trade and the cityscape. How is this for a panorama? There's something about having mountains right next to the sea, isn't there? You know, when you hear the name Shenzhen Special Economic Zone and also the words financial hub in China, you don't really think of scenes like this, right? It's more like skyscrapers and businessmen in suits. But actually, Shenzhen has so much more to offer. In this episode, we've seen that Shenzhen has such a rich history that's preserved in places like Dafeng Fortress and also has a fantastic art scene and touristy areas like this where you can get an adrenaline rush and also some decent rest and relaxation. My name is Min Zui Li. I'll catch you next time on Travelog for the second episode here in Shenzhen. Thanks for watching us.